this is um, Thursday, the, I believe, 16th. Of 17th. 17th of September, thank you. And um, Senate Government Operations. And what, what we've done is um, the reason we've set this particular um, session up is <clears throat> I also serve on judiciary. And when we were, um, Commissioner Baker was talking to us um, and we're going over the uh, corrections budget with judiciary. And one of the things he said, or one of the things that came up was I asked about the, um, You're frozen, Madam Chair. Oh dear. I guess you could take over, Anthony, until she comes back in. I'd rather, Jeanette, can you, well, you can't hear us, obviously. No. Boy, this Zoom thing, I'm telling you. Got Imagine worse. if we were doing a roll call vote on something that was only going to be like one or vote, one vote off, and right. you got kicked out, and yep. you know how he goes through the names twice in case. How, how would that work if you actually had no control over the fact that you got thrown out of the uh, the meeting? I wondered about that today when uh, somebody got thrown out. Oh, I think it was uh, Senator Baruth, and he couldn't vote because he was frozen. And they called his name twice, and he was able to get back in. Here she comes back in. We waited for you. Yep. Yeah, unmute yourself now. You unmute. Thank you. Now you're we back. We seem to momentarily have lost our electricity. Oh, oh really? Yeah. Oh. Everything just went out, and I and I saw while I was trying to get myself back in, I saw a note from Senator Bray that said he can't find the the link that's highlight or that's um, blue so he can't I'll, get I'll, in. I'll send it to him. It wasn't in blue. You have to copy and paste it. Oh, I, I had Gail send it to me again in blue. I did I, also send it to Senator Bray. So he should be joining us. Okay. Shortly. Okay. And also it's in Gail's email to us. Yes, but sometimes it isn't in blue so you can't click on it. Oh. Yeah. So um, in blue probably isn't the technical term, but um, <laughs> it sounds like a, a state of mind in okay. blue or a bad movie. Um, uh. So the reason that we did this is because, as I was trying to say before we lost electricity, that we um, I had asked the commissioner about the lack of PPEs in corrections, because what we heard from VSEA is that they were having to make their own, their own um, gowns and masks and stuff. <clears throat> and one of the things he said is that they were doing their own, for some reason, they were doing their own purchasing instead of doing it through um, EOC. And, um, and is that, he- Is um, EOC what? the same DGS? No, EOC is Emergency Operations Center. Oh, oh, okay, right, right. So he um, he said that what they had had they had sort um, uh, gotten a site for where they could purchase. I don't remember what it was, ninety thousand PPEs, and but by the time they got through the purchasing system and got an actual purchase order from BGS, there were very few of them left. Every, people, Other people had scorfed them up. So since we're um, responsible for contracting this committee, I thought we might just want to hear from BGS about whether there were emergency provisions put in around the, the um, issuing of purchase orders or um, what, what might have been the, the issue for this particular one. Um, and um, are you commissioner now, Jennifer? 
Hi. Um, uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair. I am the acting commissioner. Uh, I think as many of you probably know, Commissioner Cole has left the state. Mm -hmm. I'm sure you will see him again uh, in the future at some point, for sure. He loves the state house, so I'm sure he'll be back in some type of capacity. Okay. Um, so, yes, I have been the acting commissioner, and this is my fourth week. <laughs> so, I don't know if you're in a position to answer the question about what happened, but but it, it, it was concerning to us. And so I am in a you, position you want, to, to you probably you haven't been before our committee before. So I, I'm going to ask us to introduce ourselves because usually we deal with the same old people all the time, you know, but you're a new face. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. Very nice I'm, to meet you, Madam Chair. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Brian Collimore representing Rutland County. Uh, and Allison Clarkson representing Windsor County District. And Senator Bray will be with us representing Addison as soon as he can get in. So, all right, thank you. Well, thank you. And um, I've been with the state uh, since 2004. I worked for VTrans for about 13 years. I was in the Accelerated Bridge Program, which I'm sure you have all heard about. Um, and then when Commissioner Cole came over to BGS, he asked me to be his deputy. And so I've been with BGS for three and a half years. In terms of operations, that's pretty much been my role for the department. So I know quite a bit when it comes to all things operating BGS. So I can certainly speak to um, this particular um, concern. What has been challenging, as you know, is sourcing PPE has been a challenge all along. And basically the reason why sourcing PPE is a challenge, as you can imagine, is that all states right, are hunting for PPE. And um, so there was sort of a lag in terms of supply and demand. The supply of PPE is getting better. Um, that being said, it, it's still not necessarily reliable. And obviously, it sort of goes up and down uh, based on what's happening in other states across the country. And so the particular issue of the 20,000 masks is that you are correct, Madam Chair. DOC went out and tried to source 20,000 uh, N95 masks. When they, when they felt that they had a source, they came to the OPC, as, as you folks on the committee very well know, um, we do all the commodities um, for the state of Vermont. And so they came to the OPC. One of the things that we do when things come to the OPC is we actually have to vet those quotes. We found that there's been a lot of manufacturers, as you can imagine, within the US and globally who, who state that they have PPE and state that they can meet your specifications and requirements. So when we look into it, that is actually not the case. And so there's quite a bit of investigation that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that all of the purchases are legitimate and that the uh, manufacturer can meet our specifications and timeline. In the case of the DOC, the 20,000 masks, what we found when we started engaging the company is that they were only able to source as, as actual smaller amounts. So while they said they could provide 20,000 masks, oh. in fact, I believe they could only provide um, 2,000, I can check that number real quick, just to, yes, 2,000 of extra small masks was all they could source at the time. I believe that DOC was under the impression that that time period where we were doing the investigation is sort of where we lost that opportunity to get those additional masks. However, in speaking with the manufacturer, it was, no, this is all we have sort of obligated to for now, but we are going to try to provide you with up to 20,000 masks, but we can't give you a guarantee in terms of when they'll be available to you. Um, and so we did, we issued a contract, we got the 20,000 or we got the 2000 masks in, but obviously uh, since that time, that manufacturer has not come forward and said, okay, we can, we can provide additional masks underneath that contract. The so, good news, I have good news though. Mm -hmm. The good, the good news is, is that anytime you're in a state of emergency, you're correct, Madam Chair, and that um, things get sourced through the SCOC which is um, the Emergency Operations Center. And what happens is, is that they have a warehouse and they buy a whole bunch of PPE or whatever it is that they're needing for that particular emergency, it goes to the warehouse. And then um, the state basically leverages the warehouse for those, for those commodities or whatever it may be. Now that we're sort of in this, what I would call steady state of the pandemic, um, both groups like uh, the Department of Corrections and the Department of Mental Health know how much they need on a daily basis. So we figured out what we call the burn rate and now we're switching that responsibility for purchasing PPE over from the SCOC to the OPC. And so Deb DeMore and her team, uh, the director of OPC, is actively working with our partners 
to figure out what that burn rate is because then we know what our need is and then they're going to start sourcing it. So basically we're getting that PPE in based on um, the need of those uh, different departments. And yesterday, actually, I spoke with um, I spoke with the Agency of Agriculture, and it turns out they also need PPE. And um, I think that there's just a uh, – we could be communicating better, I think, across the enterprise and the executive branch about where to go for what you need. So, for example, yesterday I hooked up um, the Agency of Agriculture with the OPC. So there's just a little bit of education that um, we need to continue to provide to our customers, but I will let you know we are very much actively working on that. So this particular <coughs> issue sounds like it was just a misunderstanding by the commissioner, or I mean a misunderstanding between um, the commissioner and BGS about what actually that is correct. happened. Anthony? That is correct. Yeah, I just want to understand um, Department of Corrections, for example, they went out and looked for the sources of PPEs as opposed to just coming to you first and saying, we need PPEs, is that the way it works? Would they normally go out on their own or would they figure, well, we need something, let's call BGS right away and see what's up. How's, where's that, how, what's the format for that? So that is, that is an excellent question. I think what's happening right now is it's that transition between going to the SEOC for your needs and getting, getting basically moving over to the OPC and I think that's where we at BGS need to do a better job of reaching out to our customers. And Deb Demore, Debbie Demore, a couple of weeks ago recognized this, right? So she's been actively reaching out to the departments that she knows that needs PPE um, to make sure that they know that you should come to the OPC. We provide all commodities for the entire state of Vermont. Um, and so that is an area we can improve on, and we are. And I think that's where the, it came from, is that people don't recognize that the OPC is available to them. And, and the SEOC at some point said, you know, we're not in that state of emergency like we were in the beginning. You need to start procuring these things on your own and not going through the SEOC. And I think that's where the discrepancy is coming from. Because you would also obviously be able to buy in greater quantity if you were, if you were doing it and bringing the different agencies together. Thanks. I was just curious how that works. I'll do that is correct. And as you know, if we buy in bulk, we can get cheaper prices. Al, I saw you had your hand up. You're on mute. Oh, I, <clears throat> I'm just no, you not know, you, Al Allison. Oh, huh? I thought you, I you thought would you, said you Allison. would think after six months or eight months we'd figure out the mute button. But good so afternoon, Allison. What did you, Thank you? What were you trying to say, Allison? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you called on me, and I didn't see. I hadn't put my gallery view on. But I just wanted to clarify with Jennifer, the acronyms just always fly around. And I, I get the Emergency Operations Center, but OPC is the Office of Purchasing. What's the C stand for? And contracting. And contracting. Got it. Right. I knew it was the per OK, thank you. Sorry, Alex. Okay. OK, Alan. Yes, good afternoon, Madam Chair. Thank you. Al Cormier from the uh, Department of Corrections. I just wanted to clarify on that that purchase with the, the 20,000, um, you know, we had done the homework on that to, to verify the validity of those, those masks and they were available to us, but what, what happened, the process was so long that we ended up losing them. So they did, we had that guarantee and then the process through going through procurement took so long that there was only 2000 left when, when we finally got the approval. So I think that the, the conversations that Commissioner Baker has had with Acting Commissioner Fitch in the last week or so, we've under, we, we've come to an understanding that there, there needs to be better communication. But um, to Senator Polina's question, we have gone through the SEOC on, on numerous occasions as, as our first try and, and we've just, we haven't gotten, I mean, we've, we have a, a running tally, a list of the requisitions we submitted to the SEOC without getting those fulfilled. Um, so that we have tried that process and, and because of the burn rates that, that we have been calculating from, from the onset of, of COVID, we've been able to really figure out what, what we need on a regular basis and, and that have, hasn't been met. So, you know, we're still waiting on over 10,000 masks from the SEOC that that, that requisition wasn't filled. Um, since March, we've used 1.4 million gloves in the Department of Corrections. That's a lot of gloves, you know, it's 700,000 pairs of gloves. And so we're, you know, we're, we're trying to keep our, our stock up. It's not that we're hoarding or, or trying to stockpile. We're trying to 
be prepared for the next onslaught of COVID should it come um, and, and trying to work with, with both BGS and the SEOC in, in getting those. But it, it hasn't, you know, it, it's felt like DOC hasn't been a priority. But again, I think we've, you know, with, with those conversations between the commissioner and the acting commissioner, I think we've, we've got to a point where we understand that, that there is a need there. And, and uh, I, I'm hoping that'll get, that'll improve as we move forward. But just to clarify that those, those 20,000 masks were there, we just, we lost them because of the process. Okay, I, I'm not exactly sure where to go from here, just that we wanted to hear what actually did happen. And um, it was very concerning to hear from the commissioner that, um, but it looks like things are improving and working out and that there's more communication and, um, and our con we we tend to refer to Debbie as our contract queen, but I guess we should also refer to her as our purchasing queen, huh? That is correct. Okay. So committee, do you have any other concerns or uh, Allison? You are I, unmuted. I, I know. You know, I can never remember. I try so hard to. Um, you can at, see it on your name. I you... know, I just did not, I, I, you have to press it to see it. Um, Al, I'd just like to know, as you look forward, what are the, uh, as, as this pandemic evolves, what are the emerging needs that you have now? And what kind of lead time and heads up can you give the Office of Purchasing and Contracting so that it isn't on a last minute basis and, and, you know, so what, what are your evolving needs? What are you finding other than gloves that, that, that you're um, needing? So uh, the, the, the priorities right now are the masks, the gloves and the gowns. And obviously as, as was stated earlier, you know, we have been manufacturing our own gowns out of, out of garbage bags. And um, while it sounds really bad, they're actually a, a very well-made product uh, to the point where we're actually supplying these gowns to the Springfield Hospital because they also have been unable to find gowns for, for their, their medical staff. So we've been supplying gowns to, to the, the hospital in Springfield. Um, but that, you know, the, the gowns, the gloves and the masks are really the, the, the PPE that we need to, to keep our staff safe. That's, those are the big three. And you are, and now it sounds like um, BGS is um, working to make sure that the, the supply is there and that they have a stockpile of them as you go, need to go through them. I believe is so, yes. Yeah. Did I understand that right? <clears throat> okay. I'm also just, I just, this, it's just a curious thing. I mean, obviously we're talking about PPEs and we imagine that we're talking about staff, but I'm just wondering what about inmates? Are they, are they wearing masks and stuff like that? They, are they doing the whole thing? They are. <laughs> Um, so we, yeah, we've, we've been providing masks to the, to the inmate population as well. And those, the N95s we've reserved for our isolation units when we have COVID positive cases, but the inmate population we've supplied with cloth masks and microfiber masks um, that, that we're also manufacturing ourselves in our facility up in Newport. Um, St. Johnsbury facility has also started with microfiber manufacturing. So um, Again, you know, we're we're trying to be innovative and, and stay ahead of the curve and being able to, to provide those masks to the inmate population. <clears throat> so you're making masks yourself, making yes. masks yourself. Yeah. Yes. Workforce development for the for our correctional uh, guests. Yes, they, yeah, the the inmates are making them. You know, we've we've purchased several sewing machines and and that That's inmate great. population is is putting those together, and we found a. Uh, a company where we can buy the microfiber. We've, the the uh, research that we've done shows that microfiber is actually a much better barrier than, than the cloth, the regular cloth masks, like a 77% blockage well, rate. For the, maybe for the you'll need to offer these to the entire state and the Office of Purchasing and Contracting will work with you guys. They'll, they'll be buying uh, microfiber masks from us, yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, so we're, we're, we're trying to stay ahead of that and, and keep our population, um, 
masked up. We've also, actually, I think we just sent another 300 of those microfiber masks to the population in Mississippi. So we've actually been supplying the, the Mississippi population with, with the masks as well. Good work. That's great. Sounds like they need it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I just want you all to know that DOC has done a phenomenal job with their inmate population and managing COVID-19. I mean, they just, they came up with a, a really good way of, of managing new people coming in. And uh, every time they've had a COVID-19 case in a correctional facility, they've tested everyone. So they've done a fantastic job at managing COVID-19 in correctional facilities. I'm not sure you guys know that, but they really have done an outstanding job. Thank you. And, and Al, how many people are now in St. Johnsbury, that overspill area that you'd set up? So there, there isn't. So we shut down the surge facility in St. Johnsbury, and that's back to normal operations. I think there. Well, we just tested that facility on Monday. There was 135 inmates that were tested there, and those are all general, general population inmates. Thanks. Any, anything else, committee? All right. Well, thank you so much for both of you for coming. Thank you.